Support for On Point and the following message comes from Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Lift the burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage and get a secure, transparent home loan approval in minutes. Skip the bank, skip the waiting, and go completely online at quickenloans.com slash on point. From WBUR Boston and NPR, I'm Tom Ashbrook, and this is On Point. We take political satire for granted in this country. Some places, it's costly. Bassem Youssef shot to fame as the John Stewart of Egypt, a thoughtful, funny, brave man in the thrilling days of the Arab Spring and after, when it wasn't so thrilling. Now, the comedian whose face was once all over the Arab world is in America, watching us. This hour on point, the brave and funny Bassem Youssef on democracy, revolution, Islam, and America. You can join us on air or online, where this conversation is always on. What do you want to know about life, the Arab world, us now, from the John Stewart of Egypt? Join us anytime at onpointradio.org or on Twitter and Facebook at On Point Radio. In John Stewart's final season as host of The Daily Show on Comedy Central, Bassem Youssef joined in, showed up to joke about the role of the United States, the role it should play in Egypt. What should America do? Okay, we want you to f- off and leave us alone. All right, fine. You know what? Fine. Yeah. Fine. Done. Yeah, but not right away. <laughs> we could still use the aid money and a few weapons and some investments. What I'm saying is, if you could gradually off, that would work better for everybody. <laughs> Joining me now from New York is Bassem Youssef, former host of Egypt's hugely popular political satire show, Al Benameg, The Show. He's the subject of the new documentary, Tickling Giants, about his rise to fame during the uprising in Egypt. Author of Revolution for Dummies, Laughing Through the Arab Spring, just out today. And he's host of the uh, Democracy Handbook with Bassem Youssef on Fusion Busy man. Bassem Yusuf, welcome to On Point. Thank you very much for being here. What's up, NPR? Hey, what's up, Bassem hey, Yusuf? Hey, how are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored to be on NPR. I mean, this is great. Uh, uh, it's such an honor. Uh, also, it's going to be great to be here on your last day since you guys are losing your uh, funding <laughs> very soon. Right. Before and we pull the, the money plug. Is going, <laughs> all the money is going to more weapons. So this oh. is better for America because, I mean, who wants to listen to NPR when you have all of these weapons to uh, to protect them from basically nothing? <laughs> the smell of napalm <laughs> in the morning, the sound of gunfire could be much more yeah. gratifying. Yeah, ah. I mean, like, hey, NPR, one hour of NPR or, like, one cup of napalm. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> that may be the formula, and it may be the formula soon. Are you mm-hmm. we, uh, are you in exile now or not? What, what What's the no, deal? No, no, it's not an exile. Here's, here's the thing. I, uh, like, the, there were, there was, like, um, a long period of harassment uh, happening to me in Egypt. I lost my show twice. Yeah. Um, and there were um, a lot of uh, legal complaints and legal harassments uh, that was, of course, pretty much politicized. And then at the end, there was this case between me and uh, my um, former network that they actually canceled my show. So we went into arbitration. It's a legal arbitration. And then we woke up one morning and we found that, like, I'm fined something like $15 million dollars. Okay. Although they well, were the ones who canceled my show. <laughs> so, of course, it was totally political. And uh, uh, this is how we, uh, people uh, in the Middle East get persecuted. Not through putting if, – if you are on a, a high profile, they will not put you in jail or torture mm. or kill you. Mm-hmm. They basically they find some other way, like Al Capone, you know, when you get yeah. him for taxes. Yeah. So uh, what happened was the verdict was like uh, announced at noon. And six hours later, I was on a plane leaving the country uh, before it gets to the news the next, next morning and I find myself in a no-flight list. Uh, oh. So this was basically a way to um, kind of eventually either put me in jail or uh, or prevent me from leaving the country. So I kind of beat them to that. What kind of crazy feeling is this to go from being – I mean, you, you had a meteoric rise there. It was controversial. There was pushback. And uh, you got – you yeah, you had trouble harassment, as you say. Uh, but you got famous in a big hurry, and then suddenly show's gone. You're not even in Egypt anymore. You're in the USA. What's is it? Is it? Is, I don't know. Exposure deprivation feeling of some kind. 
Uh, no, I mean, I, w- I, I got famous when I was in my 40s, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, okay. So it's kind of like I didn't born, I wasn't born into it like mm-hmm. uh, Justin Bieber or something. <laughs> so basically, uh, I, I, when, when it came to me very fast and very sudden, it, I always treated this as an anomaly. Uh, I spent like 19 years of my life as a medical student, as a heart surgeon. Mm -hmm. So to actually move into this new space was something new to me. It never, I never, I never let it go to my head. Uh, And um, when it happened, I kind of like, I saw it coming and I appreciate the time that I enjoyed um, being famous, uh, hopefully for all the good reasons, because you can... um, you can get famous here for all the wrong reasons, like yeah. cash me outside. <laughs> but uh, but like I think I, I think I I I paid my dues. I think I I stayed truthful for my for the message of satire and comedy. I didn't accept to be used uh, as a tool like ma- many other comedians in the Arab world, where basically they're allowed to be on air just because they would give a fake sense of democracy, which, by the way, I was offered. I was offered to come back. I was offered, like, huge paychecks. Uh, to, to do, do what? To be, like, a to mildly do, to, to funny do, person? To be, like, a less To sharp? do my show again, but, yeah. like, under surveillance, under supervision. Uh, uh, so, basically, they wanted me as a makeup on their on the face of the regime, and yeah. I told them, no way in hell I'm going to do this. Uh, although they, 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 they promised to drop all my charges, they promised to, you know, get back on the good side of uh, the government, huge paychecks. And I remember one of my of my former colleagues, quote unquote colleagues in my previous channel told me, Dr. Bassem, you know, uh, this is this is the this is how it is here. You know, when the wind is too strong, you just bend down Mm. until it passes as as long as you're in the Mm -hmm. public eye. So I, I remember telling him on the phone, well, you know what? If you bend down once, you stay bent. Yeah. And you've been there for 20 years, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. He never called again, so. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I guess not. And you're not there. You're here. What has it been like? What was it like last year? I mean, you were there as Mubarak uh, fell. You were on the air when Mohammed Morsi came in, Muslim Brotherhood and all that. You you uh, saw General Assisi and the, sort of the military roll in. And then last year you watched Donald Trump's ascent in the United States from a front row seat. What was that like? Nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like yesterday I was on uh, uh, The Daily Show and I said, like, I am the unluckiest SOB in the world. I, 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 left, I, I left my country as my our dictatorship was setting in. And I'm here just in time where you are starting yours, which is lovely. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I actually have a, re, I have a theory. I, th- I yeah. think Donald Trump is a secret Muslim. <laughs> Come on. Come on. I mean, f- first of all, it's not the first time. You had already a secret Muslim yes. president. So yeah, or, we already established yeah. that Obama is a secret Muslim. Okay. I mean, this is a fact. <laughs> this is a fact. Breitbart, Fox no. News, Alex <laughs> okay, Jones okay. said that. That kind so of fact. It, that kind of it, fact. So okay. it is a fact. It's, it's got that kind of alternative fact. And I think Donald Trump is also a secret Muslim. I mean, what, what, what are the, what's the evidence, uh, Mr. I Trump? mean, first of all, first of all, he... Um, uh, he's a strong man. He expands the military. He, uh, he he's a fan of torture. Uh, he uh, uh, he uh, you know he deliver promises he will never uh, he, he 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 gives promises he'll never deliver. Uh, he talks in the name of religion and he never ever read the book. Uh, he uses religion he doesn't know anything about, and uh, he bans you know other Muslims which many of our Muslim re- leaders do. So basically, he is a secret Muslim. For uh, for him, the Muslim that he hates are fake Muslims, you know. <laughs> so for him, we're fake. So I think he's friends with the uh, Muslim leaders back home. And the Muslim and Arab media, you, th- th- I mean, when I say like state-run yeah. media, yeah. they love him. <laughs> <laughs> they love him. I mean, you got you got in trouble not so long ago for something something like this, where you were you said we shouldn't forget or ignore that we in the Arab world and Muslim world have done the same kind of thing. You were talking about Donald Trump uh, being perceived as going after Muslims, and you yes. said, "Well, we do the same thing with with non Muslims," and you got a lot of blowback from. Uh, oh yeah. The well, well, here's the th- well, here's the thing. I mean, I don't know why is it uh, like difficult for us to admit that we have problems in our society, and what I said. 
was a, a absolutely like in not in any way um, uh, g- giving Trump an excuse of what she's doing. I said, what Trump is doing is bad. But we have also, this is a good opportunity for us as Muslims to have an open discussion of what's happening in our community. I mean, we are not perfect. There is racism in the West, and also there is racism in the Muslim world. And when I say this, I'm not mm. saying that like, oh, we had it coming or we deserve what yep. Trump is doing to yep. us. Yep. As a matter of fact, what we have seen here in America, what Trump has been doing, allowed stuff happening that we never thought possible. For example, when there were two Jewish cemeteries vandalized, mm-hmm. the Muslim communities went out and um, raised more than $200,000 to help mm-hmm. put them back together, uh, uh, like uh, fix uh, mm-hmm. uh, fix that. There were like twenty two rabbis in New York that were arrested when they went out and protested the Muslim ban. This is good. This would would not have happened before. And the thing is, we. I mean, I, I believe that all people are good uh, until they are exposed to some kind of media rhetoric or re- religious rhetoric that basically brainwashed them. There is a lot of hate in a political and religious rhetoric in the West against Muslims. And there's a lot of hate in political, media, and religious rhetoric in Muslim world against non-Muslims. As a matter of fact, there is a lot of hate and yeah. rhetoric against other Muslims within Muslim countries. Yeah. We Muslims, uh, Sunni and Shia, they are at each other's throat. Mm. There is a lot of Muslims who have all of these indoctrinated ideas against Christian, Jews, and atheists, and other Muslims who are not as Muslim as them. Mm. And what I have said, that this is... It's time for us to have this as an open discussion because you know what happened? We should own this discussion because when I come here and all of these ignorant people, it's like, why don't you uh, denounce what's happening in the Muslim world and racism? It's like, we know what? We are. But we say this in Arabic and you don't understand Arabic, so you don't know what the hell we're talking about. We as Muslims have to have this kind of open discussion and I think... um, it's a beginning. If we, but if everybody just talks about how how racist they are, where does that go? We all, we all uh, it goes to a discussion. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is on point. We're talking this hour with Egyptian comedian, dissenter, television star. Bassem Youssef, he rocketed to fame during the Arab Spring, became known as the John Stewart of Egypt. Now he's in, well, he says he's not exile, but if he goes back, can he leave again? He's in the U.S. and looking at the whole world, the U.S. included. He's out with a new book. It is democ- it is, uh, it is laughing, excuse me, la- uh, revolution for dummies, revolution for dummies, laughing through the Arab Spring. You may have seen him in his show on fusion last year, Democracy Handbook with Bassem Youssef. He was all over the place in August. He was out mm, imagining what life would look like for Muslims under a President Trump. This was a few months before the election. Looked like it might be about to happen. Took it upon himself. Uh, Of course, he's a comedian to round up all the Muslims in the U.S. and get them out of the country before Trump became president. Here from Democracy Handbook. All Muslims, make your way to the nearest airport. The time is now. All right, guys, when I call your name, you step forward. Okay, first cap, Muhammad, Muhammad, Muhammad. Second cap, Muhammad, Muhammad. Yep, just go, go, everybody go. It was too late. We were already on the no-fly list. <laughs> the heroic Bassem Youssef trying to save the Muslim population of the United States, but it's not always quite so funny. Out there with Democracy Handbook, here in one episode he visited a Florida gun supply in Inverness, Florida, talked with the owner there, Andy Hallinan, who had created a, a, what he called a Muslim-free zone. It's it pretty ragged here. So what's the best thing about being uh, Muslim-free? Um, we sold a bunch of really great stuff. For instance, we came up with our bumper stickers. It says, warning, this car is a MFZ. Now, we didn't necessarily want to spell out Muslim Free Zone because that would be car bomb territory, right? That would be the only reason, yeah. yeah. Uh, we produced our ISIS hunting permits. It says, no tagging required, no bagging limit. That's so funny. Uh, we worked with a company to create the Mohammed targets. Realistic looking jihadis, but we taped the San Bernardino shooters' faces on them and they started selling them better. <laughs> uh, Mohammed target for $3, Mohammed with crotch shot for five bucks yeah yeah that's real Bassem Youssef out doing it he's with us today from New York and you can join us what do you want to know about the Arab world Egypt the us now from the John Stewart of Egypt what do you want the John Stewart of Egypt to be thinking about talking about now here 
on Islam, Muslims, travel bans, electronic devices, the future. Man, you keep your cool, Bassem, in that gun shop. Uh, he, yeah. I mean, he doesn't understand that you're Muslim. You're asking these questions. It's just about yeah. his... Uh, he, I, open, I, he opened to me like an oyster. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, good for you, but what, what you saw in there was not exactly a beautiful pearl. I mean, that's just about as uh, straight up racist as you want to get. <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, I, I, uh, you will not believe it, but this interview for it was basically pretty much enlightening for me because he told me stuff that I actually heard afterwards from people that went to Christian schools in California. So, for example, uh, I asked him, why do you think that... Um, Islam is is evil. He said, like, I think that Islam is inherently evil, not because of what's written in the book, not because of the practices, not because of interpretation, is because Muslims and Arabs are descendants of slaves. I said, excuse me. It's like, what? yeah, because Abraham had two wives and his, uh, his yeah. like, wife and mm-hmm. his... Um, yeah. Uh, his slave. So Ishmael came from a slave. So all of us are descendants of mm, slaves. Mm. <laughs> so that's why we're evil. And mm. I said, wow. wow. I mean, can layer I... Layer upon can, layer there. And, and and I said, like, wow. I mean, it, like, really, Muslim is the new black. It's like, very, seriously, he's actually like, he's having the most racist stuff to say about us. And uh, uh, I think... Uh, uh, I should be asking for repara- what you call repari- re- reparations. <laughs> reparations? Oh my God. Where, where do you think this is going? I mean, there, there there has been a real change after even 9-11, George W. Bush stood up and, and called on Americans to be open and warm to their, you know, f- Muslims in their midst. Yeah, uh, isn't it funny that we're quoting George W. Bush right now as the voice of reason after he basically destroyed two countries and run your military and your country and your Federal yeah. Reserve to the ground? Uh, isn't it amazing that now you look at George W. Bush as a good example? Uh, this is amazing. I mean, seriously, George W. Bush like came out on Ellen DeGeneres and he celebrated. And I can't even, I mean, because of him, like a whole country is in ruins right now because of Iraq. Like, look at what happened in Iraq, what happened in the Middle East. And 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 the, the fact, like, you can, like, sugar talk, sweet talk Muslims all the time, but, like, it doesn't really matter if you go and bomb the hell out of them in their old country. Well, okay, but so, what about when you, when you, now there's almost a kind of a move or a message out of the White House to... Uh, exclude Muslims from the mainstream of accepted American life somehow. Yeah, I mean, uh, what did you expect? Uh, th- this this has been in the making for for decades now. Donald Trump didn't invent it. Donald and, and uh, Donald Trump just rode on the wave. It started before in Sarah Palin, the Tea Party, George W. Bush. It started a long time ago. So what we are we're, what we're seeing right now is basically the end game of something that was happening was lurking. In the darkness. The thing is, we happen to be the enemies now. Uh, you always need an enemy. You had the Soviet Union, then it didn't work, and then there was a void, and there was no Soviet Union yeah. anyway yeah. anymore. So there's a void. So we stepped in. You're welcome, America. So um, <laughs> you, you needed that kind of an enemy. So I think we're 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 keeping you busy. Uh, so, uh, but when you we're say just you doing say, our jobs, you say Trump is guilty. You say he's guilty of racism and discrimination. But then you said, well, Muslims do the same thing the other way around. If that's all true, how do we fix this? I mean, you, you no, 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 but, but 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 here's the thing. I, I just like beca- but I just want to make sure. Yes, yep. everybody is guilty of racism somehow. Uh, but when I say but Muslim are, it's not an excuse for what Trump is doing. And most of the stuff that Muslims do do it because of the effect of their media, of their religious leaders, and their leaders. Whatever is happening in the Muslim community now mm-hmm. is by by anyways. By no way, an excuse of what's happening uh, that Trump is doing here, because many Muslims here basically escaped those kind of racism yes. in their own countries to come here to find a better life, a, a more understanding, a more coexistence. So, so I just want to make this clear, because as you know, people I use know. sound bites, yes, of course they do, and then they come and bite me in the yeah, you know right in the there, behind. right so, there. Yes. But the, okay. the, the suggestion is, uh, among some of these days, that look, this won't work. The guy in his gun shop, the, the suggestion is we won't live together. We can't live together. This won't work. And I, I want to know what you say to that. Well, I, I, it's not really, there's no really easy fix. Those people, uh, 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 let me give you an example mm-hmm. from my own country, uh, from my own region. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is, 
you, everybody, everywhere in the world have certain political, social, economical problems, right? Yeah. And usually the, um, the solution for these problems are extremely complex. Mm-hmm. Facts, truth, real solutions are complex. They're not easy, I mean, which is really strange that we say that the truth is not that simple. Mm-hmm. Because when you, to solve these problems, it's, it's pretty much multilayered, right? Mm-hmm. However... Somebody will come along, a religious leader, a political leader, uh, a media figure, Mm -hmm. and will just give you the easiest solution ever. It's not us. It is someone else. Mm -hmm. It is the enemy. We are suffering because they hate us. We can't find jobs because they're stealing our jobs. We can't um, can't have a better health insurance or a better uh, um, uh, economical um, situation because they are stealing our jobs. They hate us. They want to kill us. They hate our lifestyle. They hate our religion. They want to take their identity, our culture, all of that. This is the same exact rhetoric that I hear back there. I mean, because... Why take responsibility and be held accountable for these problems? It's better to shoot the problem and, and project it on someone else. Who, who's so it projected got, on in Egypt today? Who's the who's the the boogeyman there? Oh, oh, of course, America. Of course, you guys are the evil ones. <laughs> Even I mean, okay. I think I'm, 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 I think America and the West have actually uh, the same way that we have served you mm-hmm, guys mm-hmm. to offer ourselves as enemies. You have helped us keep give some legitimacy to our leaders uh, because if there is no enemy, if there is no sense of an international conspiracy working against us, I mean, what, what, what do you expect? They, they, they would say like, oh, sorry, we're incompetent. We can't, we can't deal with these problems. But so they have what, to project on you. What's the thought then that, uh, I mean, in the end, it, seemed, it took a while, but it seemed like the Obama administration kind of helped push Mubarak out or, or you know, smiled on that path. And is the is the Egyptians thinking today that Washington somehow put the military back in charge? Well, here's the thing. You know, of course, 1984, George Orwell double think mm. the fact that you can have two contradicting yep. thoughts yep. at the same time. Yep. So this is exactly what's happening. We are receiving annual military aid from America. And in the same time, America is conspiring against us. <laughs> it's like, mm, I mean, I mean, I'll give you an example. So, you know, now, you know, this um, this kind of um, crazy conspiracies from the right wing when they say like Obama uh, founded ISIS. Yeah. Mm. We've been saying this for four years back in Egypt. I mean, <laughs> way, ahead of, way ahead of us. We are, we are ahead of you guys. We are ahead of you. It's kind of like uh, uh, now you're following us. It's like we are leading the way on conspiracy theory land um, because um, uh, this is why now it's like, oh, thank God. I mean, you, 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 you need to watch uh, when I on oh, Trevor Noah yesterday mm, and yeah. I actually put parts of Egyptian media like uh, celebrating the, the Trump win. It's like, thank God, now we have an, administra- an administration that will fight terrorism. Thank God that Obama is gone. Trump is a winner. He's going to work for our behalf. And then we woke up in the morning and he banned our laptops. What the hell? <laughs> this, you can't fly to America now on Egypt Air with your laptop in your lap or Saudi but or Turkish. But you can fly from Egypt Air from America with your laptop, which... What's happening? <laughs> well, yeah, well, because yeah, because it's, you know you don't load it with explosives when you're in America, but that's the of course, right. Of, this, of, this but is, you can load it with explosives in Egypt. Of uh, yeah, well, I guess there's plenty of explosives in this country. Bassem Youssef is with us. Uh, funny, famous, uh, brave guy in the midst of the Arab Spring. Now he's in America, looking back, looking at this country. Basim Youssef is out with a new book. It is Revolution for Dummies Laughing Through the Arab Spring. Lots of callers for you from all over the country. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Mustafa is calling. Mustafa, you're on the air with Basim Youssef. Hi, Tom. How are you? Very well. You're very welcome. What do you think of Basim? Basim, uh, how are you? I, uh, as an Algerian, I love your show and I love you as a person. Uh, I would love to see you having a show here in the U.S. So how, how can we help you? To open your own show. Well, I think you should uh, go into mass emailing and uh, spam every <laughs> single uh, uh, network and production company in the country. It's like, we want this guy on television and we promise he's not going to blow himself up. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> hey, well, why not? I, 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 why, Trevor why not Noah, be, be nervous. Up? Bring in Boston Yusuf. 
Oh no, you said I thought they said like why not blow why not oh, no, why no, not no, blow no, yourself no, up? No, okay, no, no, no. so as a, <laughs> I hope like here's the thing. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, I in, I really enjoy the fact that like there's a lot of Arabs and Egyptians and Muslims support me. But like at the end of the day, we have to be realistic. We are a very small minority. I, I know that uh, many Americans think that we are basically forty percent of the population, but we are less than three percent. But um, I hope that this will you know um, this is one of the things that basically concerns me that I would love to change. Um, a lot of people now uh, complain about like uh, why Muslims or Arabs don't feel that they are welcomed here or don't feel that they are have a voice but because basically we're not represented. If we, if we are represented well, other than being terrorist number three, yeah. uh, <laughs> I think that will make a difference because you have seen now the change in American media. You have seen Fresh Off the Boat, you know, an yep. Asian family. You mm-hmm. have Quantico and mm-hmm. a beautiful Indian British mm-hmm. um, uh, actress. Uh, we, I hope that we ha- we find our way into the American media because here's the thing: if a certain part of the population is not represented, mm-hmm. you are basically giving the message to the audience one of two things: they either don't exist, mm. or there's something wrong with these. Yeah, people. yeah, yeah. So if you if you basically uh, give a, a fair representation. And Arabs and Muslims and Middle Easterners are like everybody else. They are good people. They're bad people. They are uh, great people. They're horrible people. Just if we have them as humans, you know, with all of the the the, the different start strata of their personality, that can change. So now, when you have uh, younger um, immigrants uh, uh, like uh, growing up and seeing their own people being represented. They will feel that this is home, that they will feel they're more um, belonging to this country. I'm sure. And this, is what, and this is what the, the whole idea of a, about a melting pot, right? So could it happen? Why not? I mean, fill in for Jimmy Fallon, fill in for Trevor Noah, then get your own show. Then, I mean, do you think it would work? I don't have a production company and I'm not the one who's calling the shot. I wish I have an executive who root for me. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't I, you say Muslims are only 3% of the United States, but I'm sure there are many more than just a Muslim audience for Basim Music. But, but, but here's the thing. We are 3% of the population, but we occupy more than 70% of your political talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's appeal, right? That's appeal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I, I think Americans have an appetite to, to understand. I don't think it's all just, you know, put a, a, a shooting range target on a, on a cutout of Muhammad. I, you know, <laughs> there's a much bigger, broader appetite than that to understand and to, and you're, and you're just funny. Why not? Yeah, why not? Mm. Hopefully. Yep. Uh, Mustafa, thanks for your call. Karam in Boston. Karam, you're on the air. Yes. Hi, Tom. Thank hi. you for taking my call. Yeah. I just want to say... Uh, hi, Dr. Bassam, and hey. uh, I, I loved your show. I think your show was, was very funny and very unique. Uh, I think you are one of the first and the last one who did uh, and combined comedy and politics at the same time. And I believe your show was very healthy to our society in general. So unfortunately, we lost your show. And I agree with the previous caller who suggested that, hey, why don't you have your show here in America? So... I know you said there is no production company who can take care of, but hopefully in the future, it's something that we're looking forward to have your show again and combine this politics and religion and humor and all together. It's it's definitely healthy. From your and lips thank you again to, for to all the heaven. The previous years. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, about this, I mean, I'm I'm actually going around now for. Mm. Uh, I have a live show that I take it on the road. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to be debuting this tonight at the town hall at New York. Yeah, so great. if you guys in the New York area <laughs> come, come and see me, come. And and you will see a combination of religion, pol- politics, humor. And uh, by the way, if you come, you can have a chance to also get my book. Uh, the ticket includes the price of the book, a pound of my flesh and a coffee maker. <laughs> Support for On Point and the following message comes from Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, it's important to work with someone you can trust who has your best interests in mind. 
With Rocket Mortgage, you get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence you need to make an informed decision. Skip the bank, skip the waiting, and go completely online at quickenloans.com slash onpoint. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. Hi, it's Tom. I'm glad you're listening to this On Point podcast. Really happy to have you here. You know, a lot of people barely know podcasts exist. They've never listened to one. Here at On Point, we want to change that. All this month, we're inviting our listeners to tell a friend about a podcast they love. Do it in real life or on social media, and make sure you let us know what you're recommending. Tell us using the hashtag tripod. That's hashtag T-R-Y-Pod. And thanks. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point. They're the opening to Basim Yusuf's big show in Egypt. I'll burn a meg from the episode where he's joined by John Stewart. That was back in 2013. You know the Daily Show here? He was big there, big up out of the Arab Spring and well beyond. Now he's in the USA. And he's thinking about all kinds of life and interaction in this country and well beyond. He's out with a new book called Revolution for Dummies, Laughing Through the Arab Spring. There's a documentary out uh, that looks at his, what, uh, migration from being a heart surgeon to becoming a comedian, political satirist, a pretty significant stature, tickling giants, it's called. That's out as well today. You may have seen him on Fusion TV, Democracy Handbook with Bassem Youssef, uh, where he went around this country and uh, interacting with Americans in this time of such, uh, what, uh, talk about tickling giants, ticklish relations uh, with the Arab world. Here's an episode from there. He visits Kevin Walker, a rebranding expert, to talk about rebranding his Arabness in the United States. So I am a Muslim Egyptian, and um, I want to play down my Arabness. Uh, Do I pass for a white person? uh, In terms of... uh, can I pass for an Italian? Yeah, why not? Okay. I bet you half the people you meet already think you're Italian. No, so, no, no. no. But, I mean, that's a way you could go if you wanted to. Oh, Madoni. Oh. Yeah? Oh. Okay, I'll work on the Italian. <laughs> okay, you'll work on the Italian. Bossa Music joins us today from New York. Hey, what, what happened to, to the Arab Spring? Americans, I don't think we have any framework for looking at the Middle East anymore. We see ISIS. You know, we've been given different frameworks by our leaders. People have tried to figure it out. Why did it come up? Why did it go away? What happened there? Here's the thing. When, when like, in the, this age of technology and instant gratification from yeah. uh, instant retweets and uh, Instagram and reposting and likes and shares, people think that revolution works like Facebook posts. Mm-hmm. They don't. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Revolutions take decades. We were happy and basically misled when we thought that in 18 days we're going to get rid of six decades of military dictatorship. It doesn't work this way. So it's kind of like when I see Americans, hey, good job on the Arab Spring. Oh, my God, you suck. I mean, it's it doesn't work this way. Mm-hmm. And um, this is uh, – it is a long process. Uh, and the, um, the instant quote-unquote success that we had – was just misleading. Uh, I mean, look at the French Revolution. Look at the American Revolution. Mm. You guys had your independence in 1776, and I guess you had street wars in D.C. for 12 years until you wrote the Constitution, mm. and then a civil war 100 years later. So mm. it's not... It, it is uh, When you are sitting here in your air-conditioned rooms and your ca- very comfy couches, mm-hmm. you can't really judge other people's experiences like, oh, it's a failure. It's history. Uh, and uh, for more details, you can buy my book, Revolution for Dummies, on Amazon right now, being bestseller. <laughs> you see how I shamelessly promoted myself? Yes, I'm yes. becoming an American already. I'm, I'm learning the, your ways. So, yeah, we, we noticed. Yes. We noticed. yes. Uh, but somehow, you know. And by the way, it's my birthday. So oh, this happy is my birthday. B- it Yusuf. is my br- I'm, I'm not kidding. It's my 43rd bir- birthday. Happy and birthday. I hope tonight when I ha- I'm in town hall, I will have 1,200 people <laughs> singing to me b- a happy birthday. I'm going to post it on Facebook and they're going to buy my book. And by the way, I have signed 900 copies of my book, each of them. <laughs> Ready to with roll. Per- yeah, with personalized 
uh, demoralizing quotes. Oh, so no. instead of saying best Basim, I was like telling them, why the hell did you buy this book? <laughs> Happy birthday to Roz in Cumberland City, uh, Tennessee. Roz, you're on the air with Basim Yusuf. Thank you for taking my call. Mm-hmm. Happy birthday. And welcome are, are you going to sing to me, Roz? Happy birthday to you. Happy <laughs> oh, <birthday> yeah. To <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, I, but I want to welcome you to America and tell you how much I admire what you do. I think it's so important that we have political satirists because we get so bogged down in what we're told by our government. And sadly, so many Americans who hate, quote, hate Muslims, no, no Muslims. We lived in the Middle East for a couple of years. I was always welcomed into my neighbor's home to have dinner with her. I was invited to her brother's wedding. And one-on-one, it gave me the opportunity to see a side of a people I would not have known otherwise. But again, welcome to America. Oh, my God. I'm in love with your accent. I would, I would go to, what, Tennessee? Is it Tennessee? Yes, yes. Cumberland City. Uh, I will go to Tennessee just to hear you speak. This is amazing. Well, thank you. This is you. lovely. Well, where did you live in the Middle East, Roz, or in the Arab world? Where were you? We, we were in Saudi Arabia in Taif for one year and on the island of Bahrain for a year. And I had the opportunity to visit Egypt and also Yemen. This was in the mid-'80s. Even me didn't have that much experience of traveling to Yemen. So, hey, kudos to you. <laughs> kudos to well, you, Raz. You. It, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. I, I yeah. wore the abaya the way I was supposed to. I followed the rules, and it was a wonderful experience. So what do you, what do you say to fellow Americans back here in the USA now, Raz, who, I mean, you've heard some of the tape we played from, from uh, Bassem's show where they're sort of... Uh, a disrespect for Muslims is very, it's kind of immediate and deep. What, what do you say when you hear that? Educate yourself. We have extremists in all religions and in all races, and we need to stop following like blind sheep and read and educate ourselves. And your book is an example of that. Hmm. Revolution for Dummies on Amazon now. Roz, thank you very much for your call. It's great to have you here. Shannon in Buford, South Carolina. Shannon, you're on with Bassam Yusuf. Hi, Tom. How are you? Very well. What do you know? I uh, just wanted to say hello to you and both Dr. Bassam. Mm. And um, just wanted to put in my little thank you to Dr. Bassam. Um, I've been an operating room nurse for 23 years of my life, most of which spent uh, doing heart surgery with cardiothoracic surgeons and I probably would still be working in the OR doing heart surgery if we had had um, cardiothoracic surgeons with the humor and wit that Dr. (laughs) Bassam has. Uh, It's good for the humor, bad for the patient. Uh, Maybe, maybe. (laughs) Shannon. It's so wonderful, though. I absolutely love, I've watched your shows before, and I cannot wait to buy your new book. Definitely will get it and send it to all my nurse friends as well. Shannon, yeah, and and, and and I tell all the people in South Carolina to uh, get the book. Maybe we can uh, make a difference in the next midterms. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Who knows? Do, do, do you miss heart surgery, Boston? As Shannon was right there in the in that operating room. Uh, do you miss it? Uh, honestly, no. Because if I was in heart surgery, I will not be here in NPR talking to all of these people from Tennessee and South Carolina. And Boston, all of these lovely people. Why would people want to listen to a heart surgeons? Like, I today I have replaced two valves. Nobody cares. <laughs> well, uh, we got Muhammad calling. Muhammad's in Milwaukee. We'll be there uh, next month. Muhammad, thank you for joining us. You're on the air. Milwaukee Bucks, hi, baby. Uh, um, hi, this is Muhammad. Yes, hi, Tom and guest. Uh, so, of course, I love uh, the fun, and uh, you bring a lot of it. My point is that the Muslim Ummah, the Muslim nation in general, has no representation. And the one who represents us, unfortunately, our leaders who are just staged and programmed by the West, of course, to see and behave the way the West wants it to be. And ISIS is also a representation, very bad representation for the Muslim Ummah. The default for the Muslim people is what is called Khilaf. Unfortunately, the word Khilaf or Caliphate has come in a bad spin and conspiracy theory or not. ISIS, I believe, is a 
not made from Muslims. I think it's a conspiracy theory. I would disagree with you, but Sam. But we as Muslims, people of the world, need to know we are try- we're striving to unite under one entity, and that is, I think, the fear, the xenophobia of the West to see Muslims unite as America has united and fought for their unity. We have that right. We need to unite, and there is a group called Hizb al-Tahrir that works really peacefully to make that happen. What do you think about that? And I will buy 10, uh, I will buy 10 copies if you agree with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will have to, uh, to forego the, that deal because I do not agree. Because here's what I, I don't agree. Uh, you, the thing is, the, um, the default of the Khilafah, as it, people say, we, we, the without caliphate. no conspiracy mm-hmm. theory, the Caliphate or whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, you can still unite as something that the European Union... Right. It doesn't have to be one caliphate because it means that the caliph will not be uh, – will just be an emir mu'minin, will just like the prince of all mu'minin. And I, 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 I don't think, I really don't believe that uh, countries built on military or religious rhetoric work uh, because when you actually create a, 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 like a country over religious basis – I don't. It, it has. It didn't. It didn't work before. It didn't uh, happen later. I mean, when in our Islamic history did ca- that the Khilafah or the Caliphate work? I mean, we have this um, fantasy about like that our best days that we were when we had one Caliphate. If you actually look at our history, the one Caliphate actually continued for less than forty years. At certain points, we had more than thirty-three Muslim Caliphates. If you look at the history, there was like a caliphate in Morocco, the caliphate in, in Andalusia, there's a caliphate in mm-hmm. uh, northern of uh, uh, Syria. I mean, there's like if you if you go and you look at the the timeline, I mean, we need to basically evolve. We can still unite as Muslims. It doesn't have to be one person. I mean, wh- wh- why would it work is just under one person? Egypt could be strong. Saudi can be strong. Uh, Libya can be strong. And together we can have like se- like some sort of a union like the EU. The fact that like the people doesn't want us to do that, to unite or the West is conspiring against us. This is exactly what the uh, Arab leaders are telling their people in order to create this kind of enemy. I mean, mm-hmm. I think people, the West will welcome a strong partnership with people who can work together in unison. Here's the thing about like what I I have criticized uh, our communities before. We have a little bit of a of a, of a conspiracy. For example, we marvel uh, about pictures of people um, giving up core, uh, 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 the Quran in in Europe, but in the same time, we our Muslim leaders, our Muslim regimes will not allow people to do the same for their own religion in our countries. Mm. The thing is, we do not have to have this form of caliphate. I don't know why do are we still hung up on caliphate. If you look at our history, the caliphate history is like any other history. It was like the Roman Empire. It was like the Greek Empire. It had its, its uh, beautiful shining points. And it, it got its drawbacks. And there was a lot of fights. There was a lot of turmoil. And basically, it is. I don't think it's the best example. Got it. Mohammed in Milwaukee, I appreciate your call. So many for you, Bassem. Uh, Charlotte in Baltimore, you're on the air. Charlotte, thanks for calling. Yes, thank you, Tom. It's an honor to be with both of you. I appreciate it. My question is has to do with the fact that Americans are woefully uninformed, misinformed about Islam. I recently spoke to a woman in a big a big box department store and she just raved on about how Islam is a very violent religion and couldn't no one could be trusted and I I had nothing to defend. I tried, but I have not read the Quran, although I know that's not true. So what's your question for Bassam? Well, she seemed relatively well-informed about other things, but she was totally uninformed about Islam. And I would just like for Dr. Bassam, thank you, to, um, to defend that, because I couldn't do it, and I know that's oh, oh. not true. Okay, so I'm not going to defend the religion. I'm going to defend the people, because here's the thing. You can get any quote from any scripture that would sound extremely violent and extremely sexist and extremely... Mas- uh, misogynist. For example, I mean, if you read the Old Testament, it's full of passages that are extremely violent, extremely horrible. 
and um, and if it's not about the religion, it's about how you uh, you basically uh, use it. For example, would you believe that Buddhists, the most peaceful people on earth, be violent? Well, in Myanmar, they are basically committing genocide against the uh, minority of Rohingya, which, by the mm. way, are a Muslim minority. And they, they and those people have nothing in the scripture to make people violent. Mm. It is the way that you use any kind of religion. I mean, if you want to pick and choose uh, stuff from any religion, it, you can make it, make it sound peaceful or you can make sound it horrible. The, 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 the only difference is that the Christian communities under the uh, Western world somehow evolved and left religion behind as to be a personal relationship between God and uh, and his subjects. In the Muslim com- communities, as people were trying to do that, their regimes and their leaders wouldn't do that because religion is an extremely compelling power to control the masses. As a matter of fact, many of the Arab countries who use this quote-unquote Sharia are basically installed by their military leaders, not by their religious, religious leaders. And they would put that as a red line not to be crossed because, hey, if today you start to criticize or rethink religion, tomorrow you're going to criticize and rethink my military authority. Mm. So the fact is any ideology in the world, whether Buddhist, Jew, Jewish, Christian, uh, Muslim, can be used anywhere you want. You can find, you can find something like Rumi, and Sufism, and you can find ISIS. You can find something like beautiful Christian chanting, or you can find West Border Baptist Church. Mm-hmm. You can find peaceful rabbis, and you can find people who would look at Arabs as a lesser people that they could be eliminated. You can find Buddhists, and you can find people like Buddhists killing other people. It is, it is the same thing. Look at India. You have like, uh, what, thousands of cults. Some of them are peaceful. And the same cults are not. Mm. So it is the way that you use the religion. And uh, I think that, uh, I mean, if we want to pick and choose, and and I think she said that the woman was Mormon. Uh, No, but uh, she she was raving, she said. (laughs) She was raving. I can't remember. But like, I mean, whatever this religion that this woman is following, we can actually get her book and use stuff from it to make it, you know, look bad. And I know that we are wrapping up, but one thing I want to say. Mm. I know that a lot of Muslims and minorities are afraid of the next quote-unquote incidents, and they are terrified. I'm going to tell you something. We should not be the ones who are terrified. Everybody should be terrified, because even if you're white, even if you're privileged, if something like this happened, and there was some sort of an atmosphere of war, of hate, even you as a white person will not be able to oppose your government, because you're going to be uh, viewed as a am patriotic uh, as an American, Basim so we Yusuf. should all get together. So thank Basim. you so much for your honor. <laughs> Great to have you, Basim Yusuf, speaking to us all. His new book is Revolution for Dummies. We want to hear more from you, Basim. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Tom Ashbrook. This is On Point.